On June 2, 2012, DGP, the Center for Design and Geopolitics, held its second annual conference. Entitled Designing Geopolitics II, it was held in the Black Box Theater of Cal IT2, the California Institute for Telecommunications and Information Technology in La Jolla, on the campus of the University of California at San Diego. Well, maybe uh, I'll, I'll kick it off with a quote from Michel Foucault because he came up a little bit in some of the earlier panels. Uh, and this is from his uh, essay, Nietzsche, Genealogy, History. He says, nothing in man, not even his body, is so sufficiently stable to serve as the basis for self-recognition or for understanding other men. Nothing, not even the body, is sufficiently stable. The traditional devices for constructing a comprehensive view of history and for retracing the past as a patient and continuous development must be systematically dismantled. That's interesting because he's making an argument against a certain kind of essentialism in this essay. And although we've never perhaps been human uh, ourselves in general, he's arguing against a, a stable definition of humanity. And it seems to me that understanding how we can position ourselves outside or after a stable definition of humanity is precisely what some of the work uh, we've been seeing across the day, but very specifically in, in Daisy and Elisa's work has been trying to do is to find a place where the human and the non-human, I won't say post-human, uh, come into contact with each other and have some kind of an interchange. And so the work is a kind of evidence of non-human processes and agencies. And, and so broadly speaking, synthetic biology is what Daisy is looking at. And, and broadly speaking, a synthetic ecology um, and computational ecology is, is what Elise is looking at. I, you're both looking at much more. And then the only other thing that I'll bring up here um, before, before asking the question, you know, what ultimately each of your work can accomplish ethically um, is is a brief passage from Paul Ewald, who uh, probably Daisy knows, a professor of biology at Amherst. And he wrote this back in 2009. He said, about a decade ago, a member of a Stanford team scraped spots on two teeth of another team member and amplified the DNA. They found sequences that were sufficiently unique to represent more than 30 new species. So not only may thousands of viruses, and then actually he goes on to develop a very long argument about why interactions between bacteria and viruses might act actually constitute the kind of trigger points for cancer, specific kinds of cancer. Uh, and then he concludes by saying, so not only may thousands of viruses need to be tested to find one correlated with a chronic disease, but even then it may be one of perhaps many different infectious causes. And, you know, in talking about orthogonal or, or a kind of a, or diagonal forms of life or parallel forms of life, um, XNA forms of life, uh, it seems to me there's a whole ethical discussion that's been raised over and over again today uh, that it would be nice in conclusion to the day to, to return to and uh, also because Natalie's work has extensively dealt with this. I think that this, for me, this would be a great starting point. Uh, and of course, because you're dealing with synthetic biology, but Elise is dealing with a kind of a computationally based synthetic ecology. I think that there's an ethics embedded in both of those works. Do you find? Yeah, it's, it's more. Is it me? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can. I think the. Um, so I didn't. I mean, there's so many different fields of synthetic biology. The thing itself is a, um, is, is a that's a soup that one can dip into and spend many hours trying to define. But there is this this call that perhaps what we need to be doing is finding an alternative set of um, code to be writing with. And in a way, that's the cleanest ethically. Um, that's the clean solution in a way. That the fact that we could um, invent our own nature and invent a separate biology to tamper with and make these structures with. And in a way, um, it seems alluring, I think. I mean, that's the work of Jason Chin and even George Church at Harvard, Jason Chin in Cambridge, um, that this is maybe the safest way to do this, that, that the idea that we could even control nature in this way and actually put design principles upon it is so kind of fundamentally um, questionable that can we actually make it yield to our human desires? Um, and that, I think, is an absolute, is an ethical question. It's a design question. And it's also um, something that, so that quote that I put up um, about synthetic bi biologists perhaps being curious as to what it was that was so offensive, 
And I think it's this that we actually have a choice over, that whether there is a choice whether we do this. Um, technology, we, we're so technology driven and progress driven that this is the assumption that it must be good because we can do it or might be able to do it. And the question of ethics coming into it is, um, it's sort of a bit of a dirty, dirty question. You know, uh, do, why would we even question something that's gonna save the entire world? Um, you're not really allowed to ask that. But I think that when you start to examine this idea of the separate set of DNAs, you know, because it's almost like, you know, it's like the Windows versus Mac operating systems that we saw today, would that even work? Um, I don't think, I think it, maybe it's a distraction that there is, like nature is a system that has its own mechanisms that um, the whole point of it is to survive, that whatever we try to engineer into it is not going to stay necessarily, it will have its own agency. And so we actually need to develop a much, a very different kind of framework to even ask these questions. Um, and I watched a presentation recently where someone brought to like the fact that in Ecuador, they've actually, part of their constitution is now that non-human um, rights uh, should be, so th th things that aren't human have equal right, so that essentially it was done for political reasons so that people in Ecuador could sue um, multinationals who were um, exploiting their ecosystem, but that there is someone that the ecosystem has a right as well. And I think these are, these are the questions that we just don't get our head around and of kind of part of all of it. And I think even your mud, um, the mud project is just so kind of shows exactly even the voids have um, significance and even greater significance than the actual material that you're starting with. But I mean, that's just a very, a starting point for you to respond. Mm. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a very loaded question. and I think we could have a uh, hour's conversation about it, but I will try to just quickly uh, respond. Uh, someone like Slavoj Žižek, for instance, he, he says, and usually I don't actually quote Žižek so much, but anyways, uh, he is talking about this kind of uh, ideas of nature or concept of nature that we established as this kind of uh, untouchable, uh, 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 pristine territory, and he's saying that the concepts of nature that we rely on are actually damaging us or, or not allowing us to uh, do anything about it and he, he actually is saying we, we need to uh, embrace extreme abstractions uh, kind of referring to again something like large data for instance or uh, embrace garbage because it's already there the, the uh, air is already kind of mutated the quality of air in fact if you would remove some of the pollutants uh, in some areas again because the ecology already mutated it, it would, uh, some species would again die. So it, it's kind of like uh, this naivete of idea of, of pristine um, uh, nature. And he's kind of also arguing for this idea of, of complex synthesis. And in, in my work, I, I just always try to, because uh, in architecture, especially this idea of green architecture that, that was promoted for many years, in the end um, uh, comes down to optimizing one system, uh, very high-tech facade, almost like fetishistic uh, high-tech facade for us coming from London. There are lots of architects working on that kind of stuff and, and yet ignoring uh, everything else. So this idea of, of uh, these different um, systems being able to synthesize locally and at the same time these agencies, we know that this is kind of not uh, it's kind of local and global at the same time. So when I'm talking about physics, this is something that some philosophers are talking about, post-planetary also agencies. So uh, something that you embed in the formation of then some local agencies that are maybe relating to social factors, as I was showing in Morocco or something like that. So, I mean, for me, it's just instead of uh, trying to um, just pretend that some things are not there, the Pandora box is already open, and, and, and somehow how do you uh, engage with complexity or this idea of open synthesis um, and, and resilience, and, and in our case, it's, it's through somehow mathematics and computation as a core, and then trying to think about these other agencies within formation of these synthetic ecologies. So that's a kind of quick answer, I guess, but it could be much longer. Okay, I would just like to um, kind of recast your talks, both of you, which I think were incredibly exhilarating, um, both with the, what I, I like to think of Daisy as a secret agent. <laughs> um, uh, and 
I mean, the the appropriation of so many different mathematical descriptions into compu into computationally useful ways in which architecture can explore. I mean, it was just thrilling to see, you know, the deft manipulation and, um, you know, s taking these materials, algorithms, mathematical and biological descriptions that are normally not seen as resources for artists, designers and architects to work in. And in so much as in doing that, um, I, you know, I, I would like to suggest that you, I, I sort of had very different stance in the field that I think, Daisy, you are very much and very self-consciously inventing synthetic biology and being a voice within this very problematic field that I think is characterized by a couple of things that I'd love to hear your, your response to. Um, uh, but with this, this idea of what is your stance in in this um, in this field? Is it cr constructing the field, or is it finding a space for art and design, or is it you know what are you doing? <laughs> um, but because uh, it seems to me that fundamentally we should do a lot of kvetching and arguing and contesting what um, synthetic biology is about, and you're doing it in the most charming way of getting inside and working with. You know, people who I think are intellectually vacuous, you know, quite frankly, who don't have interesting questions, who are appropriating ideas of, um, you know, m disease monitoring. You know, that's not what their work is on. That's not what they're interested in doing. And it's bullshit to, to try and, you know, veil their agenda, which is to a very specific agenda to disregard much of the biological knowledge we have to simplify it into an appropriate use engineering um, knowledge and say, well, we're going to make this work with biological systems. And um, there's a sort of short history because I, I went through Stanford and was thrown out of um, a design class with um, uh, that was David Kelly, the founder of, of um, IDEO, um, for precisely the sorts of things that you're doing, right? They, you know, why are we doing this? What are we working for? So the stance of the designer, and to the extent the designer, the designer and the, uh, Rich Gold actually made this interesting distinction between the scientist and the artist who he aligned and the uh, designer and the engineer, right? That basically designers, engineers are prostitutes. They do it for, you know, they do it for the money, they do it for the corporation. They'll, it's a service structure of design professions that makes a, gives you a stance of, you know, of course you can't ask the fundamental questions. Of course you have to produce the IDEO logo because you have to do that on every single drawing, every note you send out, and it's on every email you send, you know, right? right that's, that's your job because that's, you know, you've delegated your capacity to make decisions and figure out what you're working on to, you know, this service structure. Um, and to that extent, it's a very different stance from that of the independent in intellectual, which is the role that you're playing um, as an artist or a scientist, which is in service of what is an interesting and important question. And it was remarkable to see that that's what you were kind of plucking out of this work and your adventures in the last few years is here's an interesting question, and here's another interesting question. And it wasn't the kind of the artifacts or the design objects or the things itself, but it was a focus on finding the questions def to define the field. And so that's a very interesting stance, I think, to take, um, and an important one that really is, if it's an ethical question, it is, you know, what is it you're doing? What are you capable of doing? To what extent can we seize the opportunity? I was going to tell the little antidote, um, antidote, the ant anecdote. Um, Paul Green um, was a biology professor at, um, at Stanford, and he worked at the Carnegie Institute, which is also there, um, and was involved in this first, um, you know, when synthetic biology was not understood to be synthetic, it was not branded as synthetic biology. And to some extent, we have to understand that the branding of synthetic biology, like the Human Genome Project or like the Human Biome Project, or is the kind of a big science way to attract funding. 
which is not to disregard the fact that most science is done not under those big logos. Most credible, you know, intellectually respectable and trusted science is not done in those under those big brand names. And how does how does that so the, the the example is that Paul Green did this beautiful work um, that really was tremendous, and Chris Somerville did this beautiful work that was really amazing. Where they did they made the first plants that produced plastic, right? The first, if you will, industrialized plant, if you um, you know, a, a, um, an organism that produced plastic, and um, and had to then get security guards because he was being attacked by environmentalists for the. The um, Paul Green actually died, um, uh, you know, tragically, um, under the attack of um, a ferocious kind of backlash, public backlash that didn't want to recognize or couldn't see the value of the work and the exploration. In this. So, so that is an anecdote to explore that some of these ideas have been explored before and have failed to to get traction. So what is it, and what is this new stance and these new hybrid models of bringing in a space for art design and questioning? And there's a really interesting parallel. I mean, seeing the parallel between the two presentations or two bodies of work was extraordinary in what you, I think, aptly called the invention of this field of synthetic ecology and uh, tremendous intellectual leadership in demonstrated and exploring what this means and wh how it can be used. But it does bring up some fundamental questions that I, um, you know, that in these kind of pioneering roles that you're in, you're kind of, you're, you have to take the flack, right, for, for um, you know, is it, an, uh, the, I think the irony of using fractal descriptions of coastlines and Mandelbrot sets and uh, is that, you know, the big cultural challenge of the 21st century is to understand how ecosystems work and that the way that we've built these hard-edged um, geometric shorelines that characterize all of our urban developments and all around the coastline here um, are radically uh, inappropriate given the consensus of scientific knowledge, that wha every additional linear foot of shoreline that we can variegate and make rough and complex will give us a thousand times the environmental services that the non-variegated version will do. So that the wetlands and the swamps and the marshes that we need to retrieve from the cultural uh, imagination, um, which, you know, these are all negative words, swamps and marshes and, you know, um, there's hundreds of words describing them, all of them uh, negative, are actually the computational natural system. And does it work to have the distributed, compl the, the complexity that we recognize and we find so beautiful and so seductive and so just alluring and gorgeous? I mean, I, I almost... I almost dribbled. I was <laughs> at the, the um, at the uh, you know the uh, um, s gorgeous imagery. What what does that actually mean, right? Do we um, and where is the role of the designer architect in designing it? Is it computationally the insight that you would um, you know that's the way the cell functions? It's the insight from the complex system that we can learn as opposed to. So in in the case of the the, and I was going to make very brief comments at this time, <laughs> this, but it's, you, know, I, I, you can't you can't be brief with such um, tremendous work. It it um, both in the social and the ecological functions, the models, the mathematical descriptions are used to retrieve uh, and address the gra the grand challenges of the twenty first century. So, does it work then for an architect to emulate that roughness or is it about designing the systems and refiguring the systems of production to emulate how natural systems work so that to put it in another way another example um, that alluring complexity that you showed in the 
in um, the you know the urban context or you know medieval um, uh, span spandrels or um, you know medieval uh, Gothic cathedrals, which were of course computed without drawings, with illiterate workforces, and structured and and built in in a way that you know looks complex but defies any capacity to computationally describe or um, and was not actually structured in that way. So that this is these the examples that you gave are where the agency is in the algorithm to produce complexity, whereas, you know, can the agency be in the structure of the design profession of who participates in the design and how that uh, the work is produced to kind of change the stance of the, the architect in this new field where it's not the architect playing God of reinventing the uh, ecology, but it is producing the kind of complexity that is so and you know that has all of these robustness and resilience and the, the tremendous um, assets that we need, but is very contingent on the role that the architect, the intellectual leader, the the person that each of you are plays in defining the field and what it is that you do. I think it's a tremendous challenge that you've both set for yourself. I'm kind of I'm intimidated by the um, the the job that you have in kind of making real the explorations you've you've done, but I w really would love to hear the articulation of your stance, right, of being responsible for. So with more more uh, control comes greater responsibility. So well, maybe. It's interesting that you brought up the fractal example, and, and the thing is that project never really took off, but uh, when I came to the scene, uh, there were 60 architects there, some of the most famous architects in the world, actually all of them, and this is, was a new developer that wanted to develop a new city, and the other proposals were actually taking the towers in Dubai and dropping them on the kind of... Um, amazing stretch, the, the only not still not destroyed stretch, stretch of Croatian coast, uh, I'm not talking about islands, but the, the coastline, uh, and uh, uh, taking a, a giant Fibonacci spiral as a beautiful mathematical object and, and over 15 kilometers of the site and using it as a symbolic urban uh, sort of uh, plan development. So that was the situation that I came in and I suggested, I tried to kind of hack into this situation uh, by proposing this kind of sampling of local physics. So this was almost just like a first sketch. So let's try to um, run these adaptive agents through the landscape and, and try to develop this, uh, generate this data of, of very high resolution where the certain st uh, steepness in combination with views and other factors happen. So how can we start? distributing these urban strategies in a much more finer, with a much more finer grain and where the landscape actually becomes, let's say, iconic or some elements of local physics. That was my kind of design strategy rather than some objects that are inserted into this sort of uh, uh, proposal. So, for instance, that was that case and perhaps uh, I wasn't clear because it was very just rushed through the examples. Can I just give you another kind of contrasting example because, uh, you know, the work you're doing is, you know, I can't say it enough, it's tremendous and and clever, you know, very clever use of, of these mathematical descriptions that I haven't seen used uh, in this way, so you know, this is this is with tremendous encouragement. But the, you know, the contrast to the the, um, the prismatic facade or uh, apartments again, which I think cleverly takes the constraints of light and creates a complexity. We Could lost that transition, of you lost it? Yeah. Well, there's someone else who was much more. <laughs> oh, <laughs> see, this, this is interesting. <laughs> so, but um, but so that it, uh, uh, there's another project in um in Spain by an uh, architect on Helbrego who. Um, had proposed uh, what looked similar, um, but a, um, it was the expansion of an existing public housing project, um, you know, and allowing people to kind of 
burst out or kind of project through, you know, put an annex on, you know, an additional space. Um, and to show how the local decisions, in this case where the agents are the residents, as opposed to the agents being modeled in the, the algorithm, are making the decisions and producing the kind of complexity that we find gorgeous and robust and resilient and adaptive. And so there we have a re, uh, if you will, the descriptions, we get the same effect, but they're achieved through changing who is the agent. We can describe them similarly, but we there's a different political process than the architect saying, this looks good. But the agents were programmed exactly with this kind of little ingredients of local, for instance, uh, patterns of local inhabitation cultures in the area. So their kind of programming was done related to that. So it, 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 it was really synthesis of what already exists as a culture, some ingredients of the culture, local materials, local physics. And also with the river example, I tried to, unfortunately, I didn't have time to unfold the whole project, but these kind of projects were it's not just these aliens being in, uh, agents, whatever, inserted into into uh, this ecology, but actually they uh, made they they uh, somehow uh, synthesize with, for instance, sedimentation and local hydrology and and local, uh, I don't know, uh, fish populations and stuff like that. So it's it's ability to synthesize these different agencies through that kind of connective hinge rather than uh, treating it as an alien that is just inserted there with uh but you're, you're still you know in, in the in the use of algorithms and so forth and all that but in, you know the most important act in I when using algorithms is the definition of the fitness function right that is really what results in the final thing that's selected. So you can show lots of different versions of the prismatic uh, apartment building. But what actually gets built, at least as far as you were des describing it, almost doesn't matter, because it could be any of these things. And we saw the, the parameters being s changed. And so my question is, and I, th I think this is what Natalie is trying to get to, is you know, what do you think is the right thing? Or, or, or how do you? identify that fitness function or, or how do you actually sort of say um, I've chosen these parameters because I hold them to be the important ones for example the 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 hydrology or the the desires of the inhabitants to have views or, or what have you because that you know always in it, even with algorithmic processes there is the designer who specifies a goal of course, and even more so than traditionally what you do with a kind of representational mode of just sketching some genius formal kind of building on the site. Here you are making design decisions even more at every step, and at least at the moment we are at the uh, point where these algorithms are still very dumb, just mm -hmm. simply saying that. Uh, so you, you do have to, and I, I don't know why that would be a, a bad thing oh, in a process a of thing. design. I'm, uh, I'm saying it's, it'd be nice to, to hear about that, because effectively what you're doing is you're, uh, and you know, may, maybe this is the wrong word, but you're curating almost, right? You're sort of selecting, you're actually evaluating, you're saying a Brownian algorithm is more appropriate here for certain reasons. But when you get to that point when you actually print the thing, you know, the 3D printer, there are other things that suddenly come into play. You know, whether it's going to stand up, whether it's big enough in the case of the pavilion for somebody to walk through it. And these are actually the things that become the most and important aspect. And that is aspect. embedded in, in the design as well. Because obviously you have to uh, work with the uh, scales of inhabitation of humans or whatever, giraffes or whoever is going to populate this uh, pavilion. And also you have to deal with the structural feedback. Obviously all these elements, they, they have to kind of um, come in. It's not just a formal exploration, mm. but it's that as well. Because it, so, in a way, you design the ecology in within which you then design certain instances. The, the reason I'm sort of pressing this point is partly actually because I've had a similar challenge in my own work. You know, pe I've uh, I've been asked, "Oh, you build these participative systems? Is it partly because you want to stand back and let somebody else take the blame for the design?" Um, and you know, I, I'm I'm sort of pushing you to 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 basically have a stance for that reason you know not to abdicate everything to the algorithm but to say actually yes the height of people is the important thing um, the fact that it stands up 
as an architect, yes, I think that's an important thing. The fact that in something that's going to be placed in the river, that the patterns of the water are the important thing. Of course, and that is precisely why I actually use algorithms in the first uh, uh, place uh, in, in order to be able to address these different ag agencies and somehow uh, human and non-human uh, and, and somehow uh, synthesize certain instances of design. So I think, and, and I, I soon our new project, which I'm not allowed to show yet, but is participatory and it's happening during the London Olympics. So um, yeah, I look forward to show you that one because <laughs> it's a completely crowdsourced uh, garden urban game. I won't say more, but anyways, uh, <laughs> it's another one that, that is coming out. That is, but, but again, as, as you've seen, and I showed very different types of applications trying to show that uh, internal resilience, that then you can enter different uh, uh, scenarios or speculations and swim in it. I, f I feel like one of the things that's at stake in the question of the fitness function is, is, is going back to what Natalie was bringing up, what you actually think the work is going to accomplish. And there's a, a passage that I can't remember the attribution. It's either Peter Watts or, or Kubrick saying that the human brain the human mind was engineered by evolution as a survival tool, not as a truth detection mechanism. And they're using that to talk about the fact that, and I'm pretty sure it's Peter Watts, that really there's very little function that the higher orders of reasoning that the human possesses are engineered over time, focused towards things like truth detection. That, that we're really built as a survival engine. Uh, and this brings up the question of what a fitness function is and how it's constituted in relationship to what you think your design is going to accomplish in both cases because you're designing buildings but really ecosystems that are partly material and partly programmatic and partly functional and partly energetic circulatory and you're designing synthetic biology that has as you as you said a kind of a, in a way an unquestionable ethical function it's like when OMA said they wanted to design a library because it's one of the unchallenged institutions. It's like designing a school or a hospital or a library or you know, a fire station. You can't question the ethics of doing that because you, know, you, you need it. But I think that the fitness function is an interesting, let's say, part of the design equation here, especially if you're acknowledging that the model, um, as Usman was saying earlier, the model can break down. Ultimately, it goes back to the kind of Chris and Anderson big data question, you know. What does it mean when you, you realize that the models that we're working on in terms of how DNA functions today are going to be completely superseded in five or seven or ten years? So how do you continue to conduct your work? Um, and, and I think that the question of the balance between the model and the simulation is an interesting question. It's come up a lot in architecture to, to kind of get cr critically deeper into the question of what the, the desire in the work is and what the outcome of the work is going to be. And to go back to the ethical question, the really big question is how do you position yourself ethically when you know that the model could be completely compromised? That's why I started off with the question of the balance between the mm -hmm. human and the non-human, because I think in the work that you showed, both of you, you are actually opening us up to the presence and the operation of the non-human and to think ethically from outside the human as a designer. And, and to me, that's one of the biggest challenges that, in fact, the, the panel in the beginning of the day faced in Larry's and Peter's panel, because in the talking of the constitution of governmentality and the talking about the quantified self together, you actually start to see that there are non-human factors. We can't say that they're intentional, but they're just trajectories that take place outside of our agendas that will then constitute government governmentality so it seems to me part of what I both find you're doing. I find a lot of this really um, alarming it's so disembodied and I mean the algorithm designing through algorithm is so counterintuitive to my own training which is very old-fashioned in architecture um, and I remember sitting in a crit at Columbia with David Benjamin and sort of wondering how you could design with a utopia point like every graph, all these generated buildings um, or designs, there was a utopia point and a line that could be drawn through them. And I wondered what the role the designer was in this. And in a way, we're completely relinquishing to the technology and to the algorithm. And unless you specify, um, you know, we were discussing this yesterday in the car, is that, you know, where's the aesthetic parameter? How do you actually decide what, you know, where, what is the human filter on all of this? It's always about fitness of function and it's very kind of, 
um, the, the terms seem very disembodied. And I think that came back to your original question for me about what is the role of the designer in all this. And it's, for me, the reason I'm doing this is trying to liberate the designer and allow us to have um, autonomy again, because I don't want to be work in a service industry. I don't think that's what, um, I mean, maybe that's my training in critical design is I think design has so much more to do, needs to take so much more responsibility for the stuff that it makes. And um, by, you know, and that is, I guess, why I find the the digitization of biology alarming. That it's um, so counterintuitive to it, sort of relinquishing control. It's us stepping back and saying that this, the computer's going to work it out, but it isn't. The human logic it sort of escapes the system, um, and in a way, that's what I'm trying to do: is to open up a space for designers to be able to be transformed. Um, synthetic biology hopefully will be a good space to for designers to be able to do this and to show that there is so much more and I think that the way you're kind of challenging what architecture can be as well as doing this but um, I just remember that was my original sensation watching chunks of buildings being designed um, by algorithm it was like where where do the people fit in and where does the context that it sits in that you can't the human has an amazing ability more, far more than a computer to, to compute all this stuff and we're sort of relinquishing that but because this is because we're standing in front of these um, poop pictures and um, and I think um, what's uh, what's perhaps interesting ab about um, this front uh, uh, frontier work um, you know is that uh, actually my first lab job was doing stool analysis that's what I did at night and scraped lots of people's poop and looked for sorts of things in it mainly blood or other things and um, and th have always been interested in the color of poop right which of course tells you a lot if your dog starts doing yellow poop it's probably got tapeworm right so um, in you can tell a lot about and we don't right we don't systematically learn from or understand or experiment or examine our poop in a way that could build the collective knowledge that we could really we don't even, it's really actually quite expensive to send off your poop for, you know, for analysis if you wanted to, in some quantified self um, ideal, kind of send off your poop every day to see, <laughs> you know, uh, what it, con it constitutes. I, I didn't even know that it's brown. What, do you know why it's brown? Does anyone know why poop is brown? It's red blood cells. That's what, it's mainly constituted in our red blood cells that are shed uh, so often in our body, which is why, you know, despite what you eat, despite how colourful it is, <laughs> it all comes out brown. And so, so this is a question, and kind of the John Dewey question of who is the who is experimenting with culture, right? And this idea that that every one of us can be doing these experiments um, and learning and sharing and producing collective knowledge about how we live in the world and what kind of, you know, this challenge of moving from calorie-based to nutrition-based ideas of food that we could learn so much from this. And is synthetic biology this opportunity to instantiate this kind of investigation? And if so, how do you achieve that? How do you take synthetic biology to create this kind of participatory ideal where we're drawing on the kind of the local distributed intelligence of these, you know, people agents um, instead of you know how do you how do you can how do you use this project to if you will dominate the druendi ideal of engineering can do anything you know delusion um, and we can you know we can ignore evolution right which is essentially his intellectual stance that evolution doesn't matter the tyranny of evolution is that his quote yes <laughs> Yeah, so um, so I think that's where it, it comes, you know, at the shit it really becomes the question. Why don't we examine our poop now and how could we use this opportunity to really instantiate collective knowledge? Um, I think so much of, I mean, the of what I've been doing over the last two or three years is, is talking to people and making the space for other people to come in. Um, and that's what I think is the opportunity. Um, so we've been, you know, last year designed a workshop where we had we, a pilot where you could teach artists and designers and thinkers and scientists and everyone together was in a lab for six days learning about synthetic biology and its cultural implications. And so there were scientists who were having their first exposure to the field through this this very mediated 
kind of um, teaching method where we even had activists kind of Skyping in for discussion and people walking out because they were so offended. And this is part of the problem in synthetic biology is this, it's, you know, it's going to save the world, of course. They always do, you know, that's what, how you sell a new technology. But there is such a rupture occurring between the people who are against it and the people who want it. And the power structure is, is so, um, you know, so extreme that we're not going to get much say in it. And if it is about making a space where, um, you know, the, in a way the designer even becomes a mediator between these different disciplines, the activist and the scientist, then that's going to be helpful. That the, There is such a communication problem and it is so fundamental that so many people can't describe. I had a really interesting conversation with a friend last week who was saying she'd been having a conversation with someone who was against compulsory organ donation. I think in France, or it was in Italy, they're signing up this law that unless you opt out, you have to go in and physically opt out of donating your organs. And he didn't have a good reason why he didn't want to do it. And she was like, you know, being you know, a good debater. And so she won. And she realized how terrible she felt afterwards for having done this. Is that actually he's allowed to have his organs. And, you know, this, this stuff is about what we're made of. And by just saying it's a, an, a, an evolution of existing technology, that to me is the the disingenuous part that maybe yes it is just evolution but i think that we're submitting to the technology and the technology is becoming the thing that you know we're sort of we've suddenly opted out um that the technology does take over that we can't um that i mean this is a point that i was trying to explore last year was that progress and evolution just uh, the non-compatible systems the same way that capitalism and sustainability are non-compatible systems one is about growth and one is about balance and unless we can actually find a sensible way to sort of work with i mean it's just not possible so something has to give um so i think for me it's it's the most important thing is making a space to get more diverse opinions in the space because the moment social science are the people who have the social contract to go in there and every grant now has social scientists kind of attached to it in synthetic biology but their papers go into their press and their journals doesn't feed back into the science of the science if it's going so fast that we're about to hit the singularity and we're going to be transformed overnight into the the grid and then that's it then the social science papers still won't have come out and the science won't have changed but here I just want to interject with one quick comment because you just mentioned, for instance, sustainability slash balance mm -hmm. equals balance. And again, uh, what I was mentioning mm -hmm. before, if you look at the, the natural history, it's full of catastrophes and it's not just uh, this meat of balance or a kind of pristine nature. Again, uh, just a okay. side comment. Well, but, uh, entropy again, is our natural state probably rather than balance and like the no but the sustainability argument is that you know you've got to put things back into the system it's a kind of cybernetic theory and it's also not the right solution it's what drew does describe as the half pipe of doom that we're always swinging between the utopian dystopia when we discuss synthetic biology and the truth is somewhere in the middle and i, I agree with him on that um but i think we get to choose where on the half pipe we we kind of fall over so i think we're we're almost out of time so i know there's at least one or two people in the audience who want to throw some questions up here. Yeah. So before asking my question, I want to thank so much both the presenters and the staff for working together, not giving up and making it work and you know, you. it was worth every second. Uh, you guys made history. Because I think this is the first Arts and Humanities conference ever which right, used this uh, opti portals. Uh, so that's amazing. Uh, so my question is um, about kind of design and kind of a price we have to pay for being able to simulate uh, right, kind of complexity which at least visually you know, approaches the complexity you know, created by nature. Right, so, so it kind of goes back to the loss of a model. So as I understand in many of your projects, which are spectacular using things like cellular automata or particle systems, right? Is it correct, right? Yeah. And, and they, in a way, you know, and basically that's part of like the whole shift in science, right? From class, classical science where you have a formula which explains how something works, you put values, you get output, to simulation which begins in the 50s, right? I mean, it slowly develops, you know, where you get these amazing things, you know, like fractals, right, or, you know, or other things, but in most simulations, 
you don't know, right? You can't predict the result. That's why you do simulation, right? So in a particle system, you start with a set of particles, you put different parameters, even at each iteration, right? The system evaluates, and when you get something, right? You know, which gives you this kind of complexity and the beauty, which is impossible to do with classical methods. But I think the price we have to pay is that, at, you know, as a designer or as an architect, you can't explain like, exactly how this thing was produced, right? So the opposite of somebody like Rem Kuhlhaus, who would say, okay, I have a program, I have to feed five types of spaces, and I'm going to stack them up, and that's my building, right? So I, I know the designers and architects over the last 20 years have been struggling, right? How do you kind of use the systems which create this complexity, but they're very hard to control, right? And obviously, you know, I, I sense that in many of your pro projects, you new students were able to solve it in some ways, but I think in general, right, we have to deal with kind of philosophically, but the price we have to pay for be able to simulate, right, at least visually, the biological complexity is, we can't explain how, how, a, machine how a machine did this. Well, I think the issue of control is not, uh, I mean, it's, it's modified, it's a different kind of control. It's more of a, I don't know, sometimes that's why I like the, the, the kind of materialist approach to, to that question. For instance, if, if sculptor is working with a particular type of stone or versus particular type of wood, there, there is a different sensibility how you work with certain malleability of material or something like that. Uh, someone like Lambros Malafouris, who also wrote on our work, also uh, wrote this book, Material Agency, or edited different texts uh, about this, and um, talks about development of a brain, for instance, in relationship to that kind of materiality of the world. So I think uh, the control is different in a sense that in representational method, you imagine something in your head and then you draw it. Uh, and here you are working with certain, you're searching, uh, you develop this kind of, uh, design search space and then you are searching for s certain behaviors and, and there is a constant iterative process of learning from it and it learning from you in a way because there is a constant interaction. Uh, so it's a different kind of control and in a mad example for instance as I was saying there is no way that we design particular state that we uh, get exactly that type of crack but we develop a behavior because with different ingredients we develop certain behavioral features of this cracking so that we could control so it's a kind of different well, aspect of and that's the, what's happening in synthetic biology is that i mean when i first started researching about five years ago it was very much about the lego approach and it was parts and and there's much more i mean drew's quote about um we need to you know we can escape from the tyranny of evolution or something along those lines. I mean, I think the tools of directed evolution are, are becoming much more commonplace in synthetic biology that, y and I think, and that's where I think the, you know, the, the solution, if there is one, or the better way is, is actually using the natural ability of the material to design itself is, you know, that's where it's something more stable is going to come out. And, f you know, Drew's latest thing, which is um, a bite of, um, a bacteria that can store one byte of data, and it's stable over a hun hundred generations. I think um, you know this is using the tools of directed evolution. So it is sort of relinquishing the engineering idea of control. Um, but whether you know what's a thousand generations, ten thousand generations, thirty thousand generations, where does it? How much does it change? And that's where the you know the engineering <coughs> dream may may be false in this. You know the the, the material wins. Um, I would like to bring up the concept of resolution in the way in which it seems to be emerging uh, or a bit inherent in all the discussions even throughout today, not only in this discussion. And I wanted to then get some response maybe from the four of you about how, where do you think that it is an important either concept or a, a missing component in, in some of the things that were approached in this panel or in another conversation. Um, for instance, I'm remembering things like problems of ethics, the fact that right now, for instance, to replicate DNA, we actually use entire civilizations, and then when they stop working, you take some elements, bacteria, and you throw the rest away. But we don't know what we're throwing away and what you're conserving and how different they are, given exactly that the generations of bacteria are uh, just you know, changing, iterating uh, um, at a, f a much faster speed than we can actually understand well. Um, and so that, that kind of um, constant using of civilizations is completely different from, for instance, problems right now of food production um, and you know meat production and etc. Crops. Um, on the other hand, for instance, the idea that actually we know very little 
um, of the bacteria world. So 95%, is it? Correct me if I'm wrong, someone, um, of the bacteria that actually exist in the world, we cannot understand what they can do um, because exactly they cannot be so-called uh, ca uh, kept in captivity. So when we whenever we try to emulate certain processes, that would then la lead to them to us using them as for symbio. But so when we're trying to understand them a bit better, they actually automatically supposedly die, as far as we know. So there seems to be like a problem of resolution in how we're thinking that we're using a particular organism and we're calling an assembly an organism or a series of distinct parts. And then at the same time, this kind of lack of resolution actually with a lot of the elements that we distill to use. On the other hand, I think throughout the entire day, we heard many times the problem of resolution come up as um, literally like the only obstacle to be able to make big questions or to solve others. So we need more and more computational power, etc. So I'm wondering, again, I think the, the question here is, I feel that it's in both the questions of the respondents, but also in your work, how you have felt that resolution is an issue itself to be dealt with, that it is hindering or or problematic, or that it is like I don't know um, a, a, qu um, a term in need of new vocabulary in your in your work. Well, I I use that word quite a bit. I mean, it was in the title of the lecture, and uh, I mean the resolution that that uh, because we have now the the uh, I'm, I will just talk from the point of view of architecture for a moment uh, because. In the past, we, we would, or still, we mostly operate at the scale of uh, a middle scale, so-called, of, of a structure and some sort of uh, programmatic bubble diagram. But if you look at the formation of certain material systems in nature, let's say a tree, the fibers, how they uh, uh, work, it's not just the kind of this tree diagram, uh, of, but, it, but it's all sorts of chemical and, and material processes at a finer resolution and uh, before uh, so far we were not uh, necessarily able to access that but now um, we are starting to access it let's say through computational physics or even different understanding of the systems or how they work um, even if we don't talk about technology so much and access in that sense so I think then this idea of uh, being uh, architects uh, kind of expanding um, resolution of being able to access design of, of materials itself or uh, incorporate, again, I was talking about amplifying local physics, things like that, or connecting uh, very micro conditions, let's say, of sedimentation material processes that you tap into to very macro, large scale developments of. Um, so there is a, a resolution from, from that point of view, uh, let's say, that, that you can directly um, connect to. Do we have time for Daisy to say one more thing, or yeah? No. I'm. I think the question of resolution is a is a great one, and um and because it you know it's such a resolute word, right? To to make a resolution um might be a, a good point to end on, but the um but the uh what is masked by complexity is its omissions, right? So um, the sedimentation models, I, I know um, very well from um, the CARP modeling, uh, Contamination Assessment and Reduction Program, that the um, New York, New Jersey estuary system, the most studied estuary system in the world, um, had a great inflow of cash and funded research to produce the most comprehensive high resolution model of the contaminants that swill around in, in there because the Port Authority was facing this tremendous problem and the Port Authority funded literally hundreds of papers to produce this um, uh, because the, the dredge material that they were dredging was, um, had used to be, you could dispose of it for a dollar a cubic uh, ton, and now then became five thousand dollars a cubic ton because it was biohazardous waste and it was toxic and you know it had to be dealt with. And uh, so there was this sudden shift of the um, that gives us anyway the in, uh, incredibly high resolution model that we see now um, being acted on, um, where the um, the dredging of the biggest Superfund site in this country with the PCBs in this area, the hotspots are being identified, and the dredging company is coming along and 
and sucking them out. So it's an inverse of the, the high resolution model that you gave us, but it shows that the kind of the resolution of the data actually omits many things we don't understand. So even in this highest resolution model with hundreds of uh, very recent papers that are, uh, you know, that are articulating what is going on, really the model is not very believable, right? It's a very simple, and you, you explain that it's simple, yet the, it doesn't appear to be. It doesn't appear to omit the lack of understanding, right? So we have this consistent misreading of the fields of um, that take on complexity in which we over over represent the legibility and the control that we have on these systems which is the lack of understanding and the lack of control and the humility of being in that position which I think is a really interesting stance of not having the resolution doesn't get us more power but does give us more responsibility somehow <laughs> thank you, thank you, Daisy, Elisa. So I just want to say very briefly, um, just thank you to everyone who's come out from Amsterdam, London, New York, Del Mar, across the street, <laughs> across the street <laughs> near and far for what for I think was an extraordinary day of, of presentations and discussions. Thank you so much for the for the patience in working with our with, with in, uh, and the. Uh, making sure this worked with the Hector and, and John and the amazing Cal teach crew uh, to here. Uh, Lev is right, this was a kind of uh, historic uh, attempt uh, hist in a f uh, poison and remedy uh, sense of both of this as well. So, but I think it's just, it's just, so just thank you very much for the day. So, we'll see you, we'll see you next week. And uh, thank you, Ben, for organizing this event.